Page 15, Ode to Joy. Theme from Ninth Symphony by Beethoven. This is actually the last movement. I would encourage you to go listen to a recording of the Ninth Symphony by Beethoven, especially the last movement. You'll hear this melody. Now, again, this is in C major. You're in C position. Starting out with a bunch of quarter notes in the, in the right hand. Uh, common time. No, I didn't mention that. No. Same as 4-4 four, four time. We're going to count to four, and we're counting quarter notes. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. It's, we're okay until you get over to the fourth measure. They got a dotted rhythm. And if you understand dotted rhythms, this is not a problem. If you don't understand it, you're going to be lost. But it's so important that you understand it because the dotted rhythms are all over the place. And it works the same. No matter what the notes are, the rule is the same. And that is the dot gets half the value of the note. And you just add them together. And that's how long a dotted note gets. Up above on the waltz, we had a dotted half note, and we said a half note gets two counts. Therefore, the dot gets one, because that's half of two. Put them together so the whole thing is worth three counts. That's a dotted half note in three, four time. Well, here we got a dotted quarter note. Well, quarter note gets one count, so the dot's going to get a half a count. Well, that'll be fun. So the whole thing is one and a half counts. One and two. So you have to count one and two and them. So that measure, the fourth measure, is one and two and. So the eighth note's gonna come on an and of two. One and two and three. Because if the dot were not there and it's just a quarter note, to a quarter note, it's a one and two and three. That's how it would be without the dot. But with the dot, it, it grabs on, it holds on a little longer. One and two and three. And that's the way that works. They all work the same. And then once you get that feel, then you don't count it anymore. You just feel it. Depending on how fast you're going. And you get it in various other places too. In this piece, the, the melody's in the right hand. Again, it's a moderato speed. You decide how fast moderato speed. If you listen to the orchestra playing it, you'll get an idea how fast they think it should go. And that's pretty much it for the right hand. The left hand, for the most part, gets these chords. These are the primary chords. If you know the primary chords, you got no problem with the left hand. You just do them. Until you get down to well, the last couple measures of the second line, you're only playing one note, which is the top note of the primary chord, of the one chord. Now, the left hand's going to move a little bit. Look at that second line. Third measure, you're here on the chords. Then when you go to the next measure, the fourth measure, you got to come up and put your third finger on the G. It's just... Just lift up and move. You got time. And then in the last line, the first note is third finger on G and the second finger on G sharp. You've had sharps and flats, right? I hope. And then one F sharp. Move around a little bit. I'm not really explaining everything because this in this book. The idea is you've already been exposed to a lot of this music stuff. You just maybe forgot some. But hopefully you understand sharps and flats. Just briefly, because it's important. A sharp, you see there at the third line, the first major in the left hand, that, that hashtag tic-tac-toe, whatever it is, pound sign. It simply raises the note a half a step. That is, a half a step is the next note on the keyboard. So the next chord here is a black note here. So that is a G sharp. And that's what they're doing here. In the second measure, the sharp sign is in front of an F. It means you gotta raise the F a half a step. Just go up one key. Here. So it's here. So you play the F sharp instead of the F. So that second measure is here. Like that. And that's how sharps work. I'm hoping you knew that already. But I'm not going to assume you did. That's why I explained it. Going to challenge you a little more. I'm going to add, I'm not adding, but I'm going to present more to it. The dynamics here are forte at the beginning. 
Dynamics, when they're put in a piece of music, apply to the melody. Melody rules. The melody is what's important. Everything else is there to support the melody. So, what they're meaning is this right hand where the melody is, that's loud. And I claps my wrist on each of these. I don't have a stiff wrist on that. Well, if the melody's loud, everything else got to be under that somewhere. Don't know how far under, but far enough under not to get in the way. So we want that. Now we're going to stay loud until we get over to the fourth measure of the second line. Then it goes to a medium soft or a mezzo piano. Moderately soft, however you want to say it. S sort of soft, yeah. Somewhere between soft and medium loud. And that's the melody. The left hand's got to be softer than that. Until you get to the third line second measure, you see the curve line goes down, the last note in the measure is a G in the left hand, that's melody. That one note in the left hand is melody. That's the only time in this piece the left hand gets any melody at all. The point is that note has to be the same loudness as what the right hand was doing. So the left hand's got to be soft for two, two notes and then loud for the so it's those starting with the third line. It's got to sound like one hand played all of that melody. That's what we want. But the left hand's helping now. Tricky. And then in the next measure it goes back to loud and that's the melody. Now it can get some people. They have a problem playing one hand louder than the other. But in piano, you got it. It's very, very important to develop that ability. So work on that. You can even do it when you're practicing scales. In the C major scale, I can practice. I can play the right hand louder than the left, or the left hand louder than the right. It's a great time to practice this stuff when you're doing the scales. I don't use a lot of exercises. The exercise books, they're kind of fun. I just don't think they're necessary because I can use the scales and the chords and all that stuff instead. And I need to know the scales and the chords and all that stuff, so why not save time? Then, on top of that, we have the phrasing. Look at the last two measures of the first line. I'm going to lift up between them. So I get a break in the sound in the right hand. There's no phrasing in the left hand. So the left hand I'm just going to play connected more or less throughout the whole thing. So the last two measures of the first line is that way. So I, the, in the right hand I'm constantly, and I do that with each of these phrases. Let's play this together slowly. You can do the dynamics and all that. I'm just going to play the notes because I want you to hear the notes and play along with me to make sure you're playing the same notes I am and you're playing them at the same time I am. And we're going to go very slowly. So go ahead and put your hands in C position. I'll give us four counts and we'll play this. One, two, ready, go. Four and one. 